We were inseparable. I mean, anywhere I was, he was right there beside me. You know, he would come to me before we would go to his mom. You know, I, I think in many ways that was part of the problems that developed in our relationship was because while she was out earning a career, it was very difficult for her to lose sight of the fact that she wasn't there bonding with Dylan the way I was. And I think that that was a huge problem for her. Mm. And I think that that has been a problem for her for a long time now. The, um, and uh, Dylan obviously very interested in sports. You guys did trips to go see like major league teams play, yes? Absolutely. Tell I mean, me a little bit about that. You did some this summer. Well, one of the goals that I've had, and, and this goes back to with Corey as well, but one of the things that I wanted to do in our lifetime was be able to go to every baseball stadium in the country and every NASCAR track in the country. So, for example, last year we went to Chicago to Wrigley Field, and then we went to Detroit to, to a NASCAR race, and then we went to Cleveland to watch the Rockies play the Indians, where we actually met Todd Helton's father while we were watching the game. And I will tell you that he spent 45 minutes and an hour talking to Dylan about what he could do to make a better baseball player. So this year, we decided Dylan was a huge Boston fan. Why, I couldn't tell you. But he wanted to go to Boston to see the Red Sox. And people thought I was crazy because I was willing to drive that far for Dylan. Just so he could see a baseball game. But that's what Dylan wanted. And I would do anything for that boy. So... While we were there, we went to New York City because we'd been to Chicago the year before and had their version of pizza, and we, he wanted to go to New York City and, and have New York City-style pizza. So we went to Brooklyn, got in taxi cabs, went to the, one of the most popular places in all of Brooklyn for pizza, stood in line for 45 minutes to an hour just to get in. And I didn't think we could eat the whole thing, and that boy ate two-thirds of it. He woofed it down. You know, we got in the cab, went back to the hotel, and then we went to Cooperstown to see the Baseball Hall of Fame. And then from there, you know, we were kind of in a hurry to get back, but, you know, that's when we went through Buffalo, just because it's a, it's, it's a town that has professional sports, mm -hmm. specifically the Bills. And you know, it's just something that the Dylan can add to his list of places that he'd been that had to do with professional sports. But, you know, I, we'd been gone probably a couple weeks. You know, he was in a hurry to get back because he wanted to spend time with his friends. He actually wanted to come here first. Mm -hmm spend time with his friends, but we were coming in from the east and we were traveling through Colorado Springs. So I suggested to Dylan that, you know, we just contact his mom and make it so that she didn't have to drive over here or whatever, because she was obviously starting a job at some level, mm -hmm. which we all know is Colorado College. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know why she tries to hide that from everybody, but she doesn't want, apparently she doesn't want me to know where she works. It's not a real stumper. I wouldn't. Anyway. Oof. So anyway, we dropped Dylan off. And then, you know, I didn't see him again, I don't think, until the date of the court hearing in September. Try. I always try at least once a week to contact him. You know, I'm not going to nag him to death. I'm not going to call him every five minutes till he returns my calls. I can text him. I can leave a voicemail. You know, I leave it up to him to respond to me when he wants to. But I don't think that his environment was very conducive for that. Um, do you think he didn't didn't like living there? Did he, did he ever say anything? Was he being bullied or having trouble making friends or? The night I picked him up from the airport, I was asking him that very question. How are you adapting to you know, your new school and how are you doing in school? And the only comment that he had made to me was that he was 
disappointed because the school wouldn't allow him to participate in the football program. And apparently because he was late getting registered and there was maybe some delay in him getting a physical done. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're talking about a, a mid-level school system which should be focused on allowing anybody that wants to participate in sports, participate in sports. And so he was hurt by that. I could hear it in his voice. That bothered him. Um, what, what were your plans for Thanksgiving? Well, we had talked about a couple of things. He was here for such a short time. We didn't have anything nailed down. You know, I anticipated and I was correct in assuming that he wanted to spend time with his friends. So that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday was kind of up in there because that was a day we could either travel to Colorado, or not Colorado Springs, but Castle Rock where my brother lives because he had made mention about wanting to go over there. Mm -hmm. Or he could hang out with his friends and come up here. and You know, just the two of us would spend Thanksgiving and then he because we'll focus on spending the rest of the time that he was here with his friends and, you know, I mean, I just wanted him to be happy. So when he, you know, wants to spend time with his friends, I get that. I understand that. I have no problem with that. All I need to know is that he's safe and where he's at mm. and how to get a hold of him. Mm. And, you know, it's like me to pop in on him, check, make sure he's at where he says he's at. Those things are important to me, you know. When he's with me, it's me and him, with the exception of his friends. You know, I know those are important to him. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I, I monitor what he does, where he's at, you know. It's just me and him. There's not people coming and going in my life because everything I focus on is him and us being together and spending that time. Um, his birthday's coming up on the 6th. Have you, uh, have you thought about what you want to do for his birthday? Try not to think about that. I, I don't know how else to put it. I mean, you know, there's not a day goes by that I am not hopeful that we will find Dylan today. And, you know, I never thought in a million years that, you know, Christmas would have come and gone and we didn't have Dylan. I would have never thought in a million years that we'd be into a new year and we don't have Dylan. And I just can't imagine, you know, his birthday rolling around and we still don't have Dylan. We need to know where he's at. We need to know that he's safe and we need to know that whoever's responsible for this has enough compassion in their heart to, to change what's been done and bring him home. I know that's important to his mom and it's very important to me. We need Dylan home. We were talking a little earlier. What do you want to say to whoever has Dylan? Let him go. Drop him off at the closest police station. Take him to a Walmart. Dump him off. Let him be. Let him go. I mean for the love of God, if you have any compassion in your heart, you would do the right thing and let him come home to his family. Are, are you convinced that someone abducted him? Well, I am. I, and, you know, I, I struggle with the fact that it, it could be somebody that he knew. You know, I didn't find out till later on that he was known to be a hitchhiker, which bothers me in that, but Dylan never met an enemy in his life, never met a stranger. That boy would talk to anybody. It, he never knew a stranger, I don't think, ever in his life. So he's very outgoing, very different from our older son, Corey. And that, that's a scary thought. It's funny because we were talking to, um, to Ryan and he said the same thing like, you know, he had been in a store and like Dylan came right up to him and was like, hey, you want to hang out? You want to be, you know, and that, you know, that that was a very, um, that's like one of the things he remembers the most about Dylan is how mm -hmm. outgoing and friendly and, and wonderful he was. And he how never, never, ever met a stranger. He would talk to anybody. And that, that's concerning. 
Um, so, so you know, we talked about like maybe maybe there's still somebody out there who saw something or thought something was strange. So during that last 24-hour period. So can you talk to us a little bit through like step by step? You went to pick him up at the airport on one time on Sunday through when you. Well, came his back. Uh, his flight was late arriving. Um, there was some delay leaving Denver. And so he didn't actually land probably, I want to say about 6, six o'clock, 6.20, something like that. I don't remember exactly what time it was. But immediately leaving the airport, we went to Walmart. Why'd you go to Walmart? Well, I had just recently come in from doing a job in Silver City, New Mexico. So, you know, I didn't have a whole lot of things for us to eat. And, you know, Dylan's always adamant about having his snacks around and things for him to snack on when he's around and so there was a need for us to go grab enough things from Walmart to be able to sustain ourselves for a day or two while we were figuring out you know I didn't even buy anything for Thanksgiving because I didn't have any concrete plan as to what we were going to do whether we were going to do it here or whether we we're going to do it somewhere else so all I was trying to do is focus on you know, having enough to get us by for the next couple of days till we can make those arrangements. You know, Dylan wanted to throw in a few videos that he found in the $5 bin, so we threw those in, which is one of the movies we would watch tonight. You know, we were together. And, you know, I mean, it, it wasn't a whole lot of things that we needed. We went to McDonald's. I wanted to go to a sit-down restaurant sit down and talk to him. He wanted to go to McDonald's. He always wants to go to McDonald's. A 13-year-old kid doesn't want to go to McDonald's. You know, it wasn't my first choice. We didn't even eat it in McDonald's. We got it in the truck, went through the drive-through, and we're eating it on our way home. So, so then you get home at what time, like 8.30? We Nine. left McDonald's probably around 7.30ish, mm -hmm. and it's about a 45-minute drive from Durango to get up here. So we would have been here probably about 8.15, 8.30 or somewhere in there. So then, um, so he's texting back and forth with his friends like, hey, I'm not gonna Well, come there's down. not a lot of cell phone service between Durango and the lake up here. And it's not until you come up past the dam that you actually can get your cell phone service as a Verizon customer. But I specifically remember him texting about that time, and he was texting on the couch after we were here watching the movie. He was over there texting or playing a video game or something. I just assumed he was texting because it's not like that he can't ever get service up here. It's just very sporadic. You know, one place he might be he can't get service, and then he could step, take a step to the left or a step to the right, and voila, all of a sudden he has service. And the two places he told me he could get service was from the corner of the couch where he was sitting, which has been changed, but it's right by the TV there, and my room. Well, he didn't go into my room. He went upstairs for a few things, brought the video DVD player down so we could watch that movie that he wanted to watch. And what movie was it? <sighs> I gotta tell you, it was really bad. <laughs> uh, Adventureland or something along those lines. Never even heard of it. It was a set, it was a low-rated movie, and I, I was struggling through it. I was, but I'm not a big movie person. I have a hard time watching any movie because my concentration on one thing for two hours is a little hard for me. Which is one of the reasons why I spend more time watching 30-minute shows like sitcoms and things like that. So, so you guys watch the movie, and then. And then you had plans to go, and then, and then what happened? Did he just? Well, we were watching the movie together. Remember the movie being finished. I, had, at some point, was pacing the floor and got up and was taking care of a few little things, you know, over here at the kitchen table while we were doing that. But, you know, it was shortly after the ending of that movie, which my guess, and I don't recall, because I don't keep track of the clock, you know, it, it must have been, I thought it was earlier in the beginning, because I was fairly tired anyway, and I, I know Dylan was tired because he indicated to me that because he'd been up till four o'clock the night before, and that he had spent most of the day in the airport traveling to get here, that he was tired. 
And, you know, it seems to me it had been about 10, 30-ish maybe by the time the movie got done, somewhere in there. And, you know, shortly after that, I ran up and went to bed, and he finished up doing whatever he was doing, watching Nickelodeon or whatever he, he was watching. And, you know, I, I get up to go run my errands because I had a payroll issue that needed to be dealt with first thing Monday morning because that's when payroll goes in. Mm -hmm. And so it was important for me to get down there as early as possible. Well, I, I wanted to leave at 6.30, so I'd be there at 7.30 when they opened the doors. You know, I spent 45 minutes, an hour, trying to get Dylan to wake up and, you know, helping him, saying, you know, Dylan, I'm going down. Because he would talk to me about going to see his friend, Ryan, mm -hmm. that morning. But he wouldn't have a no part of it, which is not uncommon for him. I mean, you can't get him to bed and you can't get him up. Pretty much how it is when he's not got school to deal with, which is most of the time when he's up here. Although he had school bus stop right down the street. So he could ride the bus from the school up here if I was home, or he could mm -hmm. ride it to his mom's house, which was a thing of beauty, because her and I didn't have to deal with transporting him. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it, it made the life easy for all of us. So, um, so, so do you remember what the last thing you said to him when you went out the door was? Yeah, Dylan, I'm leaving to go down to town and run my errands. If you need anything, call me, call me when you get up. If there's anything you need. Never heard from him. I'd send him text messages, you know, asking him, hey, dude, are you up yet? You know, call me. Is there anything you need? And then, you know, by the time I got up here, it was close to 1130, probably. So did you do payroll, a work payroll thing? So you went down to the yeah, office? I, there, and then had, well, anything else you did not during that morning? I spoke with my divorce attorney because we were in the process of filing some papers with the courts in regards to, you know, the, the divorce side of stuff. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, I made a phone call to the property management company because there was, there was a check that they were trying to get that I had sent to them and I just wanted to make sure. But I didn't stop by there, that was a simple phone call. Did you, did you rush back at all? Did you think like, well, that's weird, I haven't heard from Dylan or anything? No, I was going to stop at the store and pick up some stuff. I was trying to get a hold of him to get a better idea of what we were going to be trying to do for Thanksgiving, knowing that I was in Durango and that I could pick up things if we needed them for Thanksgiving or what we were going to kind of do. So I, that's what was my biggest reason for trying to communicate with him. You know, he's had time to sleep on it for a night, so at this point, you know, maybe he's thought about it and can give me some way to figure out where we're going from here. Mm -hmm. You know, when you drive up here, you don't want to go to Durango again the next day. So you have to think ahead. You know, you got to make sure you pick up everything you need while you're in town because it's a long way to Durango or Bayfield to get something you've overlooked. Yeah. Teenagers don't always understand those no, kinds of they things. Don't. <laughs> they don't. And it wasn't a huge issue because I was already prepared to be back up here to pick him up because I was going to take him down to mm -hmm. Bayfield so he could see Ryan and Fernando and Wesley and all of that. When did you know something was wrong? Well, when I got home and he wasn't here, I didn't think much of it at the time. Because it's not unlike him to go wandering off and he'll walk down to the river across the street or, you know, he might go up into the campground where he can be next to the river up there. I didn't think a whole lot of it. And I had laid down and took a nap which is something I try to do as much as I can when I'm not working because we always work, you know, 14-hour days. and It feels good to be home. And it was probably 2.30 by the time I realized that Dylan still's not home. And so I'm, I'm thinking, well, if he ain't going to return my text messages and I ain't hearing my phone ringing because he ain't calling me, I need to go find that boy. So I stopped by his friend Tristan's house down across from the marina up here at the lake and nobody answered the door. So I'm thinking, well, I didn't see his fishing pole, you know, and I thought maybe he had wandered off and gone, went fishing, so maybe he was with Tristan at the lake. So I'm driving by the lake, looking for him and Tristan, didn't see anything. As I was going down to Bayfield to check with Ryan, who I found at his friend Fernando's house, and as soon as I went to Fernando, because I don't know where all of them live, but I knew where a couple of them live, enough to get pointed in the right direction. 
First place I went, boom, there's Ryan and Fernando. And first words out of their mouth, we haven't heard from Dylan all day. But that's when it hit me, just something wasn't right. And I immediately went to the marshal's office in Bayfield. Do you remember what you told them? Well, I told them that you know, I hadn't heard from Dylan all day and I didn't think much of it. And when I got down to the marshal's office or to his friend um, Ryan's house or Fernando, and anyway, when I ran across his friends and they hadn't heard from him, then that's when I went over to the marshal's office and told them that, you know, we need to find him, make contact with him. They were going to put out like a wellness check where they just notify the local authorities to keep an eye out for him, make contact with him, so somebody can bang him in the head and say, hey, your dad's trying to get a hold of you, your friends are trying to get a hold of you, you need to communicate to somebody. But at that moment in time, I felt the need to address this issue with mom. So I immediately asked her, had she heard from him? And indicated to her that, you know, I hadn't heard from him all day, and that I was at the marshal's office, taking care of this, and that's when, you know, pretty much all hell broke loose with her. Because she hadn't heard from him all day either. Well, not as she indicated to me, no. And that's when I think she became concerned. And so she called the sheriff's department, but apparently, because I went to the marshal's office and she went to the sheriff's office, there was a time delay in the communication between the marshal's office getting this information out so that, because apparently, from what I understand, the sheriff's office had no idea that I had been to the marshal's office in that short period of time. Um, at, at what point did you, do you, and do you think there's any chance that he like literally just, you know, was frustrated with something, got his backpack and said, I'm out of here? No, because Dylan's a peacekeeper. I, I believe that Dylan is the kind of kid that when he's with his mom tries to keep peace with her and will tell her whatever she wants to hear. I think he's like that with his brother and I think that he's very much like that with me. I don't bug him about what goes on with mom. You know, I focus on him, but you know, he and I get along when we're together, contrary to what other people might think and I, I can only contribute that to him being a peacekeeper because he doesn't want to see any turmoil between mom and dad. And I think very much he, he fights to prevent that as best that he knows how to do. And, you know, for us to be in the situation that we are today where, you know, she's at my throat and I want to be at her throat and I don't see any benefit from this as it relates to helping our son. You know, she, she alludes to the fact in interviews that she's done that, you know, I, I'm not reaching out to her or I'm eluding her or I'm being quiet. You know, all I can tell you is that I'm a private person and, and I tend to bottle things up inside me, deal with them in my own way. I think that I see her being more vocal about things and being a mom, I can only imagine that her focus is trying to find somebody to blame. And it's easier for her to blame me than it is anybody else. Because in her eyes, I'm the last one that's seen him. Do you blame yourself too, a little bit? I normally wouldn't, but I do. I do blame myself. I, I, I relive this a thousand times and every time it comes back to, I seen him laying on the couch and I didn't try hard enough maybe to wake him up, to have him come with me, knowing that he had talked about going to spend time with his friends and letting him sleep like he does so many times before. I beat myself up over that constantly. But that's not, that's not helping me and it's not helping Dylan. I mean, it's hard enough f for any parent to have to deal with something like this. And, and, and to sit here and beat yourself up over and over and over again about what you could have done differently, could have made the difference, is not helping me stay strong, which is what I feel like I need to do for Dylan. I don't know how to do it, and I struggle with that every day. But it's, just, it's something that I believe that I have to dig down deeper and deeper every day to find those will and to find the strength to stay strong for him because I believe that he needs both of his parents. He needs me to do that for him and I know he needs his mom to do that for him. If, um, if Dylan can hear this, 
What do you want to say to him? That we love you and that we want you to come home and that we want whoever has done this to you to just drop you off somewhere and make it so that you can come back to whether it be his mom. I don't care if it's his mom that he reaches out to. I don't care if it's me he reaches out to or his brother he reaches out to. Anybody, just let him come home. Let us know that he's safe. Um, wh you, you, you've kind of shied away from the cameras over the last couple of months. Why sit down now and talk to me like this? Because the focus needs to stay on Dylan and whatever it's going to take to find him. And what I've noticed over the last little bit is there's not as much attention in the media and Dylan as maybe there should be. Now, it's harder for me to monitor what goes on in other parts of the state, but, you know, Albuquerque stations, I don't think, have done a very particularly good job of keeping this out there. And, you know, if, if that's what it takes to keep this out there so that people can be reminded every day that we have a 13-year-old boy that's missing and we need to find him, and we need to find him today. Do you know what? Hang on, let me flip the page. Um, do you, because of all people, because you're here and, and you were the last one to see him, you're probably the closest non-police investigator to the investigation. Um, we, we talked about, um, well, we already, already talked about his backpack, but the fact that his backpack was missing, does that make you think that maybe he left willingly with someone? Well, that thought has crossed my mind. I mean, I know that in the conversation that he and I had driving up here on Sunday night, that, you know, there was some talk about him spending time with his friends and knowing Dylan, I assumed that part of that included spending the night, Monday night, and being with his friends on Tuesday. So when I didn't come across his backpack immediately, I guess I didn't think a whole lot of it because how much can he have in it? I mean, it's a backpack. My guess is he had a few changes of clothes. You know, there's talk about his cell phone charger being in it. There's not much in it. He didn't bring his video games. He didn't bring any of the things that he would do while he was here with me. So I didn't think much of it at the time. But the fact that he didn't leave anything behind is a question that's been raised by more than one person. And it makes you wonder that when Dylan left, was he taking everything that he had because he knew where he was going and who he was with? Or did he take his things because he, he was going to spend time with his friends and he wanted to change the clothes? I have a hard time believing that he was thinking that way because Dylan is not the kind of kid that worries about you know wearing clothes more than a day. Do you think that he, when he left, was still wearing the clothes he was wearing at Walmart the night before? Um, yeah, I have every reason to believe that. Have the, the investigators ruled out anything to you? Ruled out internet predators is that somebody met him online? Ruled out like someone offering him, you know, seeing him outside hanging out, offering him a ride or? Um, authorities haven't said a whole lot about anything, to be honest with you. Um, they have indicated to me that they have checked out the nine or 10 registered offenders that are in a 20 mile radius here. Ironically, one of which stays right down the road from me, just around the corner. Um, I question, they were quick to respond to me that they had ruled them out, but I guess I question how deep can you check into people within a 24 or 48 hour period and come back with that conclusion? It, they told me every, all the sex offenders had alibis. Well, and that's what they told me, but they did that within a 24 to 48 hour period. I have a hard time believing that you can dig that deep and check everybody out that thoroughly to make those kinds of conclusions. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's raised questions within me. I know that law enforcement's doing everything possible. They're, they're doing what they think they need to be doing, which is another reason why I tend to not participate in as much media as maybe my ex-wife does, because I, I believe in letting the investigation run its natural course. They need to look at everybody, and I'll be honest with you, all of us are suspects. We are all suspects. I don't think they've ruled out anything or anybody. And 
You know, I'm fine with that. I want them to look close because the, the closer they look at me, the more they're going to talk to people that know me. And the more that they talk to the people that know me are going to find that how much Dylan means to me and how my life evolves around my son and that there's nothing I won't do for him. You know, I would trade places with him in a heartbeat if I thought it would bring him home safely. Uh, I just have a, a few more questions for you. Um, and, and since and since you brought it up, um, you know, we, we talk, you mentioned investigators have to look at everybody. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have to ask you this question. Did you have anything whatsoever to do with Dylan's disappearance? Absolutely not. I would never do anything to harm that boy. I know they're looking at me as being involved in some kind of kidnapping scheme, which is one of the reasons why I want them to look closely at me. Because the more that they look at me, the more they're going to realize that I have nothing to do with this. There's no possible way I would ever do anything to cause harm or misery to my son. Do you have any idea what did happen to him then? I can only speculate. And it's hard for me to, to voice my opinion as far as that goes. Because I'll be honest with you, the only thing that matters and the only thing in my mind that should matter to anybody is finding Dylan. You know, I'm not interested in pointing fingers. I'm not interested in blaming anybody. My only interest is finding Dylan. And I think that once we find Dylan and bring him home, it will bring all the answers to the questions that we don't have. I, I can speculate all day long. Do you think he's still alive? Absolutely. I think we all have to hold on to that thread of hope that that's a very good possibility. I mean, we've seen this in other cases with children that have been gone for periods of time where they are alive and they do end up coming home. And I think as parents, we don't want to believe the worst has happened to our son. I think we want to hold on to every possible thread that we can that he's alive and he's well and that he's going to come home and everything's going to be okay. And, and, and I think it's a thread that we all hold on to. You know, does it take away the fact that it, the, the opposite doesn't cross our mind? Absolutely not. But I'm not going to dwell on what may or may not be. I have to believe that Dylan's out there and he's safe. And at some point, he's either going to find a way to reach out to somebody or whoever's responsible for this is going to let him go. Um, well, well we, we, we certainly do hope that this, our, our story can help jog somebody's memory or, you know, spur someone to come forward. No, oh, and, I, and, I, and that's why I'm willing to participate in this, because this isn't about me. This isn't about his mom. This is about Dylan and keeping the, the, the community, the nation as a whole, aware of the fact that we have a 13-year-old boy that's missing and he needs to be brought home. He needs to come home. He needs to reach out to his parents. He needs to reach out to anybody in his family. And we need to know that he's okay. Anna once um, interviewed John Benet Ramsey's family, and the parents talked about kind of the feeling inside, not knowing where your kid is. Can you try? I, I don't know if you can even describe it. It's a nagging feeling that just eats you from the inside out. I mean, not knowing is is probably the worst thing that could possibly happen to a parent when it relates to their children. You know, and it it just eats you from the inside out because there's so many things that run through your mind. You know, you play this over and over again in your head. You think of every possible scenario that you can possibly think of. You know, when I go into town, everybody I see, I, I look at them as like, where's my son? Like everybody I look at, I, I, first question I want to have to them is, where's my son? And I, I know that's a rational way to think, but that's how, that's how I feel. And, you know, that's something that I struggle with every day when I'm praying to him, when I'm talking to him. You know, these are things that I, I say to him. 
we need to have you home and we need to, you need to find a way to get to a phone or find a way to reach out to somebody or you know pray to your abductors that they're going to let you go and, and everything's going to be okay and we're going to have our son back I'm sorry about that yeah, that's, no, fine. that's fine I turned my work one off but Anna, did you have any questions? You've been kind of the silent partner in all this. I just I keep thinking that, you know, you guys were on a mission to see all the ballparks and NASCAR tracks and I'm sure you're not done yet, right? You not got, even you, close. You got some unfinished business. Absolutely. Which one which one are you planning to go see next with him? Well, our focus has been on trying to find the ones that are the hardest for us to get to which for us here tend to be in the north and the northeast. So, you know, the easiest ones to get to would be the ones in Texas, the ones in California, you know, those kind of places. And because I work a lot in California, you know, I'm fairly familiar with how to get to them and all those kinds of things. So I'm kind of trying to save those for last or to use them as fillers in case we don't have enough time or we can take a long road trip and see two or three events at a time. But, you know, you got Las Vegas for NASCAR, you got Phoenix for baseball, NASCAR, you got California, a couple tracks out there that have multiple baseball stadiums in that. So those are the easiest ones for us to find. But, you know, I mean, the, the one that was, the two that were the most important was Chicago and Boston because they're the oldest stadiums that are still in existence. And they're the only ones that don't carry corporate names on them. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Wrigley's amazing, isn't it? Oh, we couldn't even find it until all of a sudden we came around the corner, boom, there it was right in our face. I mean, it, it's that secluded off the street. that We were walking, just following the people, trying to figure out where it's at. We knew we were getting close, and then all of a sudden we step around the corner, bam, it hit us like a rock. But, you know, to be in the stands. I guess that's how you hope this investigation might end is just boom. Right. Which is why I, every day I pray that today's the day that we're going to get the answers that we're all searching for. You know. And that's the hope that I, I, I hold on to. And I, I mean, I can't speak for his mom, but I certainly would like to think that, you know, that's the same thing that she's thinking. What's the first thing you're going to do when you see him again? give him a hug and tell him how much I love him and ask him what it is he wants because whatever it is I'll give it to him I'll find a way to make it happen for him whatever he wants which is probably my biggest weakness with him yeah. he doesn't know the word no with me hmm. anything he wants he's got me wrapped around his finger there's not very few things I will ever say no to him about but you know Things that are important to him, like his baseball. He's not a big NASCAR fan, but we can incorporate those mm -hmm. things. I think it's hard for him to sit and watch that kind of thing, unlike baseball, where he understands the concepts and mm -hmm. what's going on. But, you know, Corey's much more of a NASCAR fan than Dylan mm -hmm. really is. But it's still something that I, I think is important as father and son that we have the ability to be able to do together yeah. because those are memories of a lifetime that nobody can take.